That's wild. Well, I think you're definitely right about all the Dante references, at least in this episode. <laughs> Not overall? You don't agree with me overall? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Monster Donut, a literary and historical deep dive into the Percy Jackson series and all of its following spin-offs. I'm Emily, a classic scholar-ish. And I'm Phoebe, a dramaturg and story consultant. And today we are joined by none other than the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Liam Crowley. <laughs> uh, Liam, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit? Yeah, well, I wish I had a cool degree like you guys have. A broadcast journalist, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> that That's my claim to fame <laughs> from my academic years. Um, But yeah, I'm an entertainment reporter for comicbook.com, and I have kind of made Percy Jackson my go-to beat. Uh, I've covered the series in depth since I started with comic book back in June of 2022, and that's just because I've been a lifelong fan. This was my first, like, franchise, I like to say, before I fell in love with movies via the Marvel Cinematic Universe and before I fell in love with TV via all the Arrow and Flash shows on the CW. I fell in love with books because of Percy Jackson. I read all five uh, in third grade. And I remember reading The Last Olympian when it came out. So I was catching up on books one through four. And my mom was not too happy about that because it meant having to pay full price for the hardcover. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I just remember falling in love with the series, revisiting it in the pandemic, having a little virtual book club with my friends and just kind of rekindled that passion for it. Heroes of Olympus were phenomenal the first time I read those through. And now it just feels like we're living the live action dream, getting to cover this show as it comes out. So Percy Jackson for you was like probably one of your most formative series then. Oh, yeah. I the amount of like things in my life with where I'm at now, especially revisiting like the lightning thief right now in at like the current age I'm at and the current state of like life I'm in. There are so many like little character traits I find of like, oh, I I probably picked that up from Beckendorf or from Luke or from Talia, like little things here and there. I'm just like, wow. Yeah. So there's so many things I just latched onto with uh, just like Percy characters and traits. And I just remember it's just so much about, you know, how how it formed my like personality and and, uh, what aspects of entertainment I flock to and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, just everything. Yeah, it's funny. I've never been asked that question before. And it's making me think. And it's a good question. I love that those three characters were the three that you went for just now. I was going to say, what'd you get from Luke, Liam? Uh, ooh, uh, parental relationships, I guess. Uh, Beckendorf, he's a great craftsman. Percy, great leader. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not saying I have these traits. I just, I, I would like to think I, you know, strive for them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. So before we get into this episode, a warning for our listeners, uh, spoilers for all three Greek and Roman series are all fair game. So if you haven't read the books, we'll probably be spoiling at least the first series for you. Yes. Um, So yeah, definitely keep an ear out. And if you want to read the books, I highly encourage it. They're great. So we get our first cold open since the first episode. I love a cold open. (laughs) Um, I mean, if we're going to be blacking out for commercial breaks, let's embrace the medium. (laughs) Let's have a cold open. And I'm glad that Krusty got the first one. It is uh, well-deserved. I thought for sure they were going to cut Krusty. I keep saying this, but I was, I figured the scene was too violent in the book and wouldn't jive with like the image that they were trying to build of Percy, which I I mean, I was half right. This isn't the scene from the lightning. (laughs) (laughs) I really wanted to see it though. (laughs) <laughs> I know personally I am in I am in mourning yeah because the Procrustes scene in the book is one of my favorite scenes in the lightning thief but I I do think what we're offered here is a good character moment not in like it goes in a different direction for learning about Percy but it is revealing about where Percy's at at the moment so I'll take it yeah <laughs> I feel I feel like I'm gonna say a lot on this podcast if I remember correctly when I'm thinking about the books but <laughs> if I remember correctly the the whole crusty chapter was kind of like recycling the same old like up oh, we're in this place can we trust this guy everything is not what it seems and then it's like oh we end up having to battle and, and get something out of it and in the show I like how they kind of altered that uh in the sense of like this was that classic we're late into the season of like 
a show that revol revolves around a hero. It doesn't have to be a superhero show specifically, but there are so many episodes of superhero shows where like the team is gelling together better. And just right. to like see Percy and Anne Lebeth's dynamic, how like the chemistry they've built together at Waterland and, and at, you know, the Lotus Casino is now being translated into how they can like approach not necessarily battles, but just conflicts. I thought was really well done. And I thought that this, this was a great way to make a nod towards a chapter that, like you said, Phoebe, is like ultimately cuttable in the grand scheme of the Lightning Thief, but they can still find a way to like pay homage to it and slot it in in something that's cool and unique and that being a cold open. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, especially when you compare it to like the Medusa encounter, which is the first time I think they're trying to go in with a plan, but they don't really agree on exactly what the approach is supposed to be beforehand. So yeah, definitely a mm -hmm. good like marker of how far they've come. In that way, it's kind of the opposite of what the scene is in the book. Because in the book, in my mind, what the crusty scene does is that it strips all of Percy's tools away from him and that like he doesn't have Annabeth or Grover to help him because they're both tied up. He can't fight his way out of it because he can tell that like the second that he makes a move, he's going to get killed. And so it's like, okay, now that you have none of that, what are you going to do? And then we sort of learn more about Percy's character through that moment. But here we kind of get the opposite getting to see him working with at least with Annabeth on on a plan that they clearly planned out beforehand <laughs> <laughs> I do want to note the lines that Krusty has in this scene mm -hmm. um where he says these beds are great for your self-confidence they show you how to fit fitting's not easy for guys like us am I right our parents make it so hard stretching us and twisting us and hacking off pieces to make us seem more like them Anywho, these beds take all that away. With these beds, you just fit. And that seems like an idea that Percy is drawn in by. And it's very reminiscent of the Circe scene to me in Sea of Monsters, where he looks in the mirror and like sees himself as, as beautiful and confident, and it, mm. it gets to him. Yeah. Although, it's also funny to me, because like, he's saying all of this stuff, and then you remember what the beds do, which is that mm -hmm. they stretch you or break off pieces of you. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of shows because he is our first, like we talked about in the books a bit, um, our first of the Sons of Poseidon behaving badly <laughs> encounters that Percy has. And in this case, it's a good window into how Percy feels right now heading into the underworld, like about himself and about his father, I think with the flashbacks this episode, um, about his mother too and all of the gods. But there's this idea of not being what everyone around you wants you to be and how they keep pulling you in every direction, hoping to make you like them. And then Procrustes, like Luke, like we talked about in episode five, is another example of someone trying not to be like the gods, like he claims, who does exactly as the gods do, in this case, stretching and twisting and hacking. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a good point. And it's like, I think it just kind of goes to further the idea that like, the monsters in this show, they're really furthering this idea that they're not just black and white, like there is like a shade of gray. Um, but at the end of the day, they still have to operate like monsters and do nefarious things. So even though Krusty is saying all these things uh, that are going to be different about the beds, it's like, well, they still have to do something bad in order for him to be an antagonist in this moment. I was also thinking, um, I, I, deep, I dove into Krusty a little bit because I was also really curious because I didn't do any research on him when we talked about the Lightning Thief. In the mythology, Theseus is the one who defeats Procrustes. But it's always mentioned as like, oh yeah, and then Theseus slew Procrustes. They never tell you how until Plutarch, who was a Greek writer living in Roman time. So he's like much further along. It's also the last of... Theseus's great deeds on his way to Athens where he's going to go become king and do all the Minotaur stuff. He like this is the moment he kind of does his last task to be able to assume like being the heir to like the kingship in Athens and like go on to do like his like really great stuff. So I kind of like the fact that for Percy this is also kind of a crossroads moment for him because he's also about to go into like his greatest deed of the series basically which is going to get his mom back and i like that again we, we mentioned with medusa that she we, we actually don't find out that whether or not she crumbles to dust like a monster because of the invisibility cap and also again we don't find out with crusty either because he's just trapped in his own bed and they just kind of leave him alive actually they don't even kill him because you hear him yelling in the next scene <laughs> yeah like in the book he crumbles to dust despite just being Another son of Poseidon. But here, who knows? Who knows what happens to him here?
Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, the actor playing Krusty, Julian Richings, my friend Julian Richings, <laughs> Depp from Supernatural, <laughs> Karen in the Lightning Thief movie, that one guy in Hannibal. If I'm watching something filmed in Vancouver, he will appear, and I love that. He's always there for me. <laughs> was he in the Lightning Thief movie? Yeah, well? he was Karen. <laughs> is, he, is he the only repeat casting? That must be like the only one. As far as I know, yeah. Wow, okay. Learn something and in a day. way, is he not the same character guarding the underworld? And he really him, is, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was interesting too. Did anyone else notice that there's, I think, twelve waterbeds arranged like in a circle in the frame when they first walk in? Well, there's eleven on screen, and then I think one more behind the camera. Hmm. Yeah, no, I I noticed that, and it made me laugh because I remember I think it was the son of Neptune when I was reading that book. I think it was like one of the earliest chapters, and when you're seven books into the Percy Jackson lore, the C tier villains and gods just don't really <laughs> scare you anymore. And I remember there was a chapter of the son of Neptune where it was like the God of like the North wind, not even the God of wind in general, the God of specifically the North wind being like, I'm going to kill Percy Jackson. I'm like, no, you're not. We're 50 pages into this book. There's 400 <laughs> pages to go. And you're the God of the North wind. And so like when I see Krusty arranging like, Here's 12 beds, and I'm going to trap every Olympian god in them one day. I'm like, man, <laughs> I love your ambition. <laughs> it, it's it's funny in that sense when we get to this this part. It's going to happen with the show, too. We're going to get to, like, season three, episode two, <laughs> and a villain's going to come along and be like, I'm going to take out Percy Jets. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> I do love how much they're humanizing them all, though. Like, I can totally see this being a thing, this character is like, ambitions to do. And I can see a god just, like, walking into this shop and being like, oh, hey. Versus I feel like in the books, I feel like that's less of a thing. Like, I think the gods feel a lot larger in the books and they feel a lot more mysterious but yeah i was i spent like way too long trying to assign which bed to which god i got stuck on the zebra <laughs> one who is the zebra <laughs> that feels dionysus to me <laughs> no but there's a leopard one next to it so i was like that's oh, okay. dionysus there's like a huge purple bed and then like one that looks kind of sea like and then one that looks very like hades-esque on one side that's and hades doesn't even have a throne on olympus so i'm like but i digress Shall we move on to our first of the flashbacks? I want to talk about the framing of this flashback from last episode. So Hermes says to Percy in episode six, um, do you know what it feels like to be so close to someone you love, knowing neither of you has any choice but to keep hurting each other? I know you do. And then he touches Percy's hand and we see the a shot of this flashback. And I just want to remind us all of, like, the framing of this, because I think it is really important, because I think it really tells us how Percy feels in this episode, and that kind of carries us through until he and Sally actually talk about it towards um, the mm -hmm. end. It's just so heartbreaking. I feel for Sally so much. <laughs> I really do. I worry that people will be angry or upset with her for yelling at him in this scene, because, like, Sally in the books, she would never yell at anyone. I like the show's portrayal of Sally, though, in that sense, because especially with the, the swimming lesson flashback, like it goes to remind you that like she is a mortal being. And that's the biggest difference between how she approaches parenting to how Poseidon approaches parenting. And I understand like a lot of people want to just paint the Greek gods in the show as like purely egotistical and villainous. But like, as we see from Poseidon in this episode, there is empathy that lives within him. But it's so hard for him to communicate that because he's immortal and just he can look at a lifespan and be like, patience is not hard. But with Sally, knowing that when her son reaches a certain age, he needs to be like trained and equipped for this world. But we can't tell him too much too early or else it's going to freak him out. So we have to kind of tiptoe him in. And when he, she sees him struggling, learn how to swim. Of course, she's going to be like impatient, freaking out, because if she feels like the clock is ticking while well, Poseidon views everything is like, well, you know everything's okay. I've heard the prophecies. We're all going to be just fine. And this is just exemplified too in the car scene of like, he like locks the car and she's like, come on, Percy, we're not playing these games. Like that's, that's how mothers can react at times. Like, like that's, that to me is being realistic with Sally. Um, and she's still a great mom. Like it's just, it goes mm -hmm. to like humanize her a little bit more. And so I understand uh, why people kind of push back on that because of her portrayal in the book. But I like that she has some layers to her in the sense of like, you know, it's hard, yeah. it's hard being a mom. And, and she expresses it that sometimes it does break her a little bit. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I really like this version of Sally. I feel like in the books, like, she is fantastic. And I think also we're seeing the version of her that's through Percy's eyes. So he sees his mom as, like, this perfect, amazing, wonderful human being who just has so much heart. And she does, but I I feel like in the show, because we're not through that lens, we can see her as a much more three-dimensional character. It's also interesting because, like you brought up, like, as we've even heard from the showrunners, like, so much of the show is about parenthood. And I think getting that full spectrum of what good parenthood looks like when it's not perfect is so important to that. Mm -hmm. And I think also she's still just getting the hang of all of this. All of this is new to her. This is her only child. So of course she's going to make mistakes like this. Yeah. And I was thinking a lot about the pairing of this flashback with this episode, because this is the episode where Percy has to choose to leave her behind. And I don't have a complete thought yet as to why, but I do want to flag that because I think it's important. That is, is, uh, when I, I feel like I'm still puzzling over this episode a little bit. That's one part of it that I feel like I sort of understand, but we'll get to it. <laughs> um, so we end this scene with, uh, Percy finally agreeing to get out of the car and we cut to them entering the underworld. This depiction of the underworld visually, I found really interesting because mm-hmm. in some ways it's very accurate to mythology, and in other ways it is it it's a little different. It's a little it's a little different. But I love that they emerge in like a field of rocks that look like teardrops. Oh, like teardrops! I didn't even think of that. I that's <laughs> what I thought they looked well, or like Hershey's Kisses. But I like teardrops better because <laughs> symbolism. So then we also see the walls of Hades, like Erebus, basically, um, which are in some depictions of the underworld and not in others. It did intrigue me, though, because, like, walls and castle walls are generally built to keep people out and also specifically for, like, siege purposes. So I was sitting here thinking, like, what is Hades keeping out? Like, what's he what's he defending against? The walls thing could be, like, an ego thing, right? Because Mm. Hades is, like, banished to the underworld, only comes up to Olympus on the winter solstice. I'm not making that up correct yeah that's right yes okay yeah (laughs) and so it might be like uh like oh if you won't let me in i'm not letting you in here not that anyone would like voluntarily (laughs) go to the underworld but it could just be like a symbol of like this is like him embracing his kingdom and just kind of trying to give some exclusivity to it even if he doesn't need to yeah it's intimidation. I, I kept thinking too, um, especially later on when we get to his throne room. Um, but I was thinking about that line in the book where Percy like thinks about how his like receiving chamber, like throne room, looks a lot like the one on Olympus, but like mm-hmm. slightly off. That was that was like a deliberate thing. Um, production designer Dan Henna, he he talked about that. We spoke at Comic Con, and he was like, "Yeah, the whole there was a big idea to make it like an inverted Olympus, essentially." And mm-hmm. I I love the design. I was so like. Remember when that first trailer came out that included the underworld? It might have been like the second or third trailer, but yeah. just being so surprised because I was like, oh, well, the underworld is hell, right? It's just like red and fiery. And the way their interpretation is like, no, Tartars will probably be hell. But the underworld is like just just gray and dreary and void of life. And he described he was like, hell is nothing. It's just like mm-hmm. it, it's not bad. It's not good. It's just purely nothing. And the whole like bleakness of it, I was like, yeah, this is just like at least, you know, hell might have a sauna you know this is like geez (laughs) just like gray and dreary and like the worst kind of rainy day yeah which i i really like because that is sort of the version in greek mythology um so i feel like there's an interesting shift that you see where i think especially as more christian ideals got mixed in with a lot of the classical stuff like long even after post-roman empire stuff you see a lot more of this idea of like heaven and hell um, but to the ancient Greeks, uh, the underworld was basically just exactly what Dan Hanna described, which is just this field where most people go and you just sort of like forget everything and you're standing around and you're just kind of like nothing, um, which is the reason why so many of the heroes are so obsessed with glory because there's this idea that like this is how you make a name for yourself. This is how you live eternally because as soon as you're gone, like you're nothing. Although I had a friend that actually wrote a thesis about uh, the difference in attitude towards death uh, pre and post like Peloponnesian War, which is the big Athens versus Sparta war. Hmm. 
I think there's a lot more value placed on life like after the Peloponnesian War, so that's where you start seeing more of that come in, but I digress. Um, when we, we also talked to Dan at Comic-Con, he mentioned this idea of, uh, or, or maybe it was Eric and Jeff, they were talking, oh, it was Eric and Jeff, actually. They were talking about how they wanted the underworld to look like it had mountains in the sky, too, which I thought was really mm-hmm. cool. And um, I think also matches a lot of the descriptions, because you see um, in, in, in ancient Greek mythology, the earth is sort of its own plane, and then you pass through what's called the Aether to get to Olympus in the heavens, which is like the upper air. And in, like, the Hymn to Demeter, there's another description of the underworld where Hermes takes Persephone back up to the mortal world, and they also have to pass through, like, an Aether, like, between worlds again. Um, And it just vibes really well to me, the way they've designed it all, is what I'm saying. So, we spy uh, Charon leading souls up to the gates. Um, I loved Percy pushing his way through the crowd of dead people and saying like we're with them up there when there's no one up there that's just, like so funny i was like he cuts lines at amusement parks all the time i know i know it <laughs> it's very new yorker of him so they make it up to the front of the line karen immediately spots that they're not dead um he responds with we're all dying to some extent which is silly but <laughs> i love him <laughs> So we are starting to see scamming Percy. It's failing, though. <laughs> failing immediately. <laughs> because Charon pulls out his whistle and calls Cerberus on them. I love seeing Annabeth taking action in this scene. That she's the one who tricks Cerberus. She's the one who throws the ball up to to Percy and Grover, assuming that one of them will probably catch it and also will squeak it when they catch it. <laughs> <laughs> and that Cerberus will jump for it. You know, you can actually see her thinking several steps ahead in this sequence, mm-hmm. which I like. I feel like this is in spirit of the obedience school uh, moment in the books. Mm-hmm. So I, I really did like that aspect and sort of shows, again, her kind of quick thinking. So um, because of Annabeth's quick thinking, they're able to get Cerberus to spit Grover out, which is great. And then he flies Percy up onto the wall with his uh, winged sand, with his uh, winged, winged converse, showing again how they're working really well as a team, even on the fly, which is great. But Grover loses his pearl, of course. Yeah. We knew this was coming. I was thinking it was going to be Percy, though. I thought Percy might lose his. I wasn't thinking oh, Grover. Why? Because he had two, and I felt like the guilt of, like, oh, I lost the one that would save my mom was going to be, like, some, some good drama, you know? <laughs> yeah, although I was thinking about the drama of Grover losing it, especially because, yeah. hear me out, the very next scene, Annabeth starts turning into a tree. <laughs> it's Thalia all over again. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I felt a lot of uh, repetition going on here with, like, I mean, it's in the next scene also, so maybe we'll get to it, but... Percy and Grover basically playing out the scene from when like Percy realized that Sally was dead in episode two um but kind of the version from the book where he's saying like it's not your fault in the way that he didn't (laughs) in the show there are there are several repetitions in the next uh scene following the flashback though following our next Mm -hmm. flashback in which the school administrator tries to deny Percy admittance because he thinks he needs better psychological help than they can offer Yeah, and I really like the way this scene was framed as well, where it's clear that Percy's hearing every word of this exchange. And again, just coming back to, again, the framing of this whole flashback where he's feeling like he can't help but hurt Sally just by being around her, essentially. And just, like, watching how that really plays out. And Asriel, I think, does an amazing job as young Percy, really, like, conveying that, which is very impressive considering that he is baby. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I... It's impressive how just by the shot and his his acting and the shot uh, focusing on him while Sally in the other room says that like she can't accept that as an answer and won't be homeschooling him that you can just feel that he feels that like she just doesn't want him yeah. there. She doesn't want him home. Yeah. Like immediate understanding. No one even says it, but you get it immediately. Yeah. Versus like us as like adults in the audience are sitting there being like, yeah, of course, homeschooling is so much work. She has to work like she's a single mom. Like, of course, like this is just too much for one person to do. But yeah, you can really feel like how he feels that she's rejecting him, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you seen that New York City rent? It's not cheap. <laughs> she, she's got to work. I was like, Sally, you should move, really. <laughs> Yonkers is right there. It's not that far. <laughs> well, we know Yonkers is whole snakes. That's true. <laughs> so this flashback then leads us back into the underworld. 
Mm. Um, where, like I said, Percy and Grover are going back and forth with Grover saying, we can't just ignore this, and Percy saying, stop, like, I don't want to talk about it, once again, um, reminding me of their conversation when Percy first woke up after the Minotaur fight. Mm. But this time he is by Grover's side, and he actually does what he didn't do in that scene, which is reassuring Grover that it wasn't his fault. But the other side of that is that this time, it seems like he is anticipating being the one who mm-hmm. might die in this situation instead of Sally. Because he says that he plans to use his pearl and stay behind. Which they don't they don't really get a moment to discuss that one. <laughs> yeah. Because they immediately run into the trees, the fields of Asphodel. They're trees. Mm-hmm. They have roots. Yeah, they're they're trees. <laughs> <laughs> this is the change because in Greek mythology, the fields of Asphodel are actually one of two things. I didn't realize there was a second option. What I always picture and what I usually think is Asphodel is actually the name of a flower that's basically like a weed. Brown stalks with white flowers on top and they just sort of like grow along the side of the road essentially. Um, so it kind of reinforces that imagery, right, of just like this nothing blah place. Or, apparently, there's other versions where the fields of Asphodel, um, where the etymology of the word comes from ash, and there's this idea that it's this white ash, which it does seem like that is the direction they went in here. Mm. Also interesting fun fact I learned in my research was there'd be basically these jars used in funerary rites, um, mainly for Athens, um, that are white jars, and that was like a whole thing that they're like painted over the white pottery. So again, sort of white being reinforced as this like color of death, which is also interesting because I believe in like Hindi mythology, white is also associated with death. That to me, I think, really explained what, what sort of the direction they took with this color story in the underworld. Mm. And I think that culminates also in like the sands around Tartarus that yeah. we get to later. But also this idea that the fields of Asphodel are not just like kind of the default location in the underworld where you've got the fields of punishment for the really bad people and the um, Elysium fields and the Isle of the Blessed for like the really, really great heroic people. Um, But instead, the fields of Asphodel here are specifically a place. Let me read out what Annabeth says exactly. The souls here are bound by regret, haunted by the choices they made in life or never made. And they're literally stuck in this field, rooted to the ground. It is very Dante's Inferno. It is specifically the seventh circle of hell, Dante's Inferno, <laughs> um, which I had, I reread. I have it with me. This is I have this in front of me instead of the lightning thief right now, <laughs> because the seventh circle of hell is reserved for violent deaths, and there's a portion of it that is specifically a forest of trees made from souls who committed suicide. So violence Mm -hmm. against yourself, which is sort of what, I mean, you're doing violence to yourself by regretting things, I guess. And Hmm. so that is where I imagine that this comes from because I know that Rick loves a Dante's Inferno (laughs) reference. (laughs) But then I like, I thought about it further and I was like, is this whole episode the seventh circle of hell it's episode seven we're in the seventh circle of hell and then i did i i fell even deeper into the rabbit hole and went and reread the seventh circle chapters or cantos sorry (laughs) (laughs) it starts with souls being brought through a river Mm -hmm. specifically the river of pain they're tortured in the river of pain um those are people who committed violence against other people and then you go to the next part which is the forest And then the next, the third round, is people who committed violence against God. And it is the burning sands, a field of sand that the souls try to cross. And then I, like, went even further into it. And I was like, is the whole thing, like, Dante's Inferno, specifically the Seventh Circle? Because the Seventh Circle starts with them meeting the Minotaur. And then they meet the Centaurs, including Chiron, after that. But then I was like, I don't know. I might be going crazy. (laughs) Well, Cressy is waterbed emporium, first of all, which you could argue are rivers of pain. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. And then I was like, or maybe the whole show, I'm going through eight circles of hell because, like, uh, the mm-hmm. third circle is gluttony. Medusa has food all over her table. The eighth circle is fraud. We know who's going to show up and be, be a, a liar <laughs> in episode eight. <laughs> it's, all, it's all coming together, actually. <laughs> Oh my god. That's wild. And I think it works on a meta level because the whole thing in the entire book series is how the West 
moves and changes and adapts to whatever like new like culture holds it and i think we see a lot of like christian and american influence on the greek mythology beyond just like the obvious stuff where it's like they're living in america doing american things but like the way the mythology is sort of portrayed the way the characters are portrayed and i do think that's interesting because dante is one of the most influential writers ever in terms of how christians living in the modern world portray and think about hell which is wild because it was all just a self-insert fanfic yep (laughs) (laughs) yeah there's more there's more on this topic later when we see that painting in hades's throne room or in Mm. his um, palace behind his throne (laughs) Mm. we'll we'll come back to this topic i have two questions in this scene the first is when did the roots start growing around annabeth was it like immediately because it seems like she hasn't moved the whole time Mm. my second question is the obvious one what choice does she regret so much that this is immediately coming up and grabbing her because she adds that line or choices that they made or never made she adds or never made i I found it interesting that like i can think of a couple regrets for like percy or grover but they're not the ones with roots growing up their legs so this must be like a big regret of annabeth's could it be like her running away like is that like because i i feel like especially with the books being from Percy's perspective, like how much of Luke influenced her running away? Like Luke clearly made the decision to run away uh, because he wanted to remove himself from that situation. But like how much of his decision impacted Annabeth, who was younger than him and like told Mm -hmm. her to leave and like kind of forced her to think or like vilify her father and like, their whole like adopted family yeah. to me that's where my mind went of like having some regret about how she left the mortal worlds behind because it just being at such a young age like it was it was established from the jump it, i actually percy is like she considers him like the best of us when she's talking to hephaestus in episode five and she's starting mm-hmm. to question so much of what she thought she knew about the greek side of this world that she's in and she even mentions in that monologue to Hephaestus, like uh, the gods are like, do these things wrong and these things wrong. And maybe at one point I was that way too, but like I'm learning now. And I'm like, that makes me think of like, well, why was she that w- that way at one point? It's because this is like essentially all she knew. Like I remember everyone always asks on like the internet, the moment like you gained consciousness. I don't remember mine. I, I must've been like four <laughs> or five years old where like you realize like, oh, oh my God, I'm alive. Like I'm a human being. I have my own thoughts. Um, And uh, for Annabeth, like did she gain consciousness while at Camp Half-Blood? And if that's mm-hmm. the case, did she even mm-hmm. have a chance to like come to terms with, with what the mortal world was like? And for that reason, if she did, quote unquote, gain consciousness while she's at Camp Half-Blood, does that make her rethink everything about life on the other side of the mist? And that to me, like, I I can't think of a more prominent regret for Annabeth than that, because anything she regrets about, like, her relationship with Percy or Luke or Grover at this point, she's corrected. Like, she's made an Mm -hmm. effort to absolve that. But anything with her father, to our knowledge... She she hasn't. So for as long as she lives with that regret, maybe that's, you know, why the roots are growing up. Yeah, mm. that makes sense to me, especially because there's another sort of framing, I think, or a callback that starts the Percy flashback, the first one we see in this episode, where we see Sally reference the Wizard of Oz, realize she hasn't shown Percy that movie, which feels like such an explicit reference to Annabeth having not seen any movies. And then he immediately makes the same joke. And Annabeth's like, what are you talking about? So I think that makes a lot of sense to me, too, of like her removal from this world being a huge piece of that. Mm-hmm. I also need to acknowledge on the other side of the mist is such a poetic way of putting that. I, I love that you said it like that. <laughs> I, uh, something about me with like interviews or writing is I hate using the same proper noun over and over again. Like I'll, I'll if I call it Percy Jackson, then I'll call it Rick Reardon's best-selling books. Then I'll call mm. it the 2005 release. Like I hate always saying the same thing. And so, yeah, sometimes I force myself <laughs> as I'm talking to be like, how can I say the mortal world differently? other side of the mist so Mm. (laughs) it's good it's good but i think i i sort of came to a similar conclusion but thinking of it more as like maybe 
where she's at in this journey looking for both because of like what she said in episode five but also because she's out here looking for percy's mom and knowing also that percy is building some kind of relationship that she hasn't been able to build with his dad um in the way that like she hasn't been able to build either of those relationships with her mom or her dad and feeling like her choices have landed her somewhere where she can't have either of those relationships so my first thought was like regrets at at least maybe leaving her dad behind completely and that that's how we get her home at the end of the season is like having this this uh solid regret but i i liked your point about um luke being basically part of the reason that she stayed on the run because i think they found mm-hmm. her pretty soon after she ran away yeah. and like she might have gone back home if, if luke and thalia hadn't found her and started talking the way that they do i thought it must be luke related but i have no evidence for it I also that was another thought that I had was I was like my brain was telling me that the answer was somewhere in Annabeth tries to swim home and a big part of that is Luke and so I was like is she piecing it together is she figuring it out like I don't know that's what I was thinking too is she's like you know she's supposed to be so far ahead and we know in the books at this point she's starting to question is this Hades is Hades really the the enemy here um, which also makes me wonder because um, because of this scene, she's not in the Hades confrontation. And I was wondering why they made that choice, too. Yeah, why remove Annabeth so early? Yeah. I was kind of glad that they, as much as I love Annabeth and want more Annabeth, <laughs> we saw a lot of Percy and Annabeth together mm-hmm. in the last couple episodes. And so I was glad to get Percy and Grover together and just yeah. the two of them. Yeah, I do like that. Now we just need the Annabeth Grover B plot. <laughs> I know beginning of season two anyone beginning well, i don't know i don't think there's room for it is, season is, two. isn't that like a season four because grover mm. is trapped sea of monsters and then annabeth is trapped titan's curse so yeah we're not getting we, this for a while <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna be like Aryan's gonna be like six two by the time they're having like a one-on-one moment so it'll be a whole gag so it'll sad. be like ha- have we ever had like a one-on-one conversation before <laughs> that's this is the worst realization that <laughs> you just gave oh, me no. <laughs> Are they? Well, there's the whole part where Percy dies and is on Calypso's island in in, the, in Battle of Earth. I think I think that's the time they have to plan his funeral. Together. Aren't yeah, but aren't Grover and uh, Tyson on their own pan side quest at that point? Yeah. Oh man. Well, I'm sure they'll find ways. I was thinking about this a lot actually, about like how little screen time Grover gets for the rest of the series, and I was like, there's no way they're gonna fix that. He's getting his own storylines in. Uh... In season two, he has to. <laughs> yeah, just the, the way they've been executing the show, and they've talked about this too, of like, the books are all from Percy, per, Percy's first person perspective, and we've had multiple scenes where Percy is nowhere in frame. So mm-hmm. I, I really don't think that they, they're mm-hmm. like Grover, sure, there might be limited book screen time going forward, but like, if it was all from Percy's perspective, we wouldn't have got Grover and Ares in the diner. And so it's yeah. like... I, I expect more scenes like Grover and Aries in the diner in a season yeah. two, three. Oh, I can see forward. it too, because he's really got to manipulate Polyphemus the whole time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Chronos time? Yeah, Chronos time. <laughs> so. Chronos uh, time. Uh, there uh-huh. we go. Oh, no. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, so they go to the third, the, what is it, the, the eighth circle of hell? No, this is still the seventh circle. It's just the third like part of it. Okay. They yeah. go to the next stage of the seventh <laughs> circle of hell, um, which I thought this was interesting because this is the same sandy landscape we've seen in Percy's dreams. And I think maybe we'll do like a full Percy dream breakdown at the end of the series. But mm-hmm. it interests me how we go back and forth between like Montauk and here and how Cronus is kind of pulling him into the entrance to Tartarus. So they're walking through the, the shoes that Grover's wearing start to flap and start to drag Grover into the pit and Percy manages to save him. The shoes come off Grover's hooves because he's got hooves and not feet. Fall into mm-hmm. the pit. And right as they're sort of slumping back in relief, they hear a telltale metallic clunk and realize that Percy has had the master bolt. I was interested in the doing the reveal here versus in the book because I think it's Hades that points it, that says to them in the book, like, you've got it. Yeah, so that they go into the Hades scene kind of with with one goal in mind which is getting Sally instead of still thinking that they're on track there's a lot of that in this show giving them things like like for example the last episode with uh at the very end with saying you know that the quest is over you can go back to camp 
and Percy saying like no I'm seeing this through like making all of these things active choices instead of just like mm-hmm. this is how the quest is supposed to go this is where I'm supposed to go next yeah I do like it and I like that they're able to go into the Haiti scene feeling like they have the upper hand for negotiating because we still get the cool reversal of the helm which I like and I, this, this characterization of Hades also is also very different. So I think it also really plays into setting that up a little bit better because I think I can't see this Hades having that same interaction with them. And you can feel how wrong Grover, and like all of them are, when yeah. Grover says he was working with Hades. It's just it, the delivery of it. You're just like, that's wrong. This all feels wrong. Whatever's going on here. Yeah. I'd be super curious to hear what non- but people who don't know what's coming um, thought of this scene. I'll ask my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so flashback number three, Sally and Percy at the, what do we think this is? Restaurant? Diner? I don't know. Looks like a diner. More, They're more kind of like restaurant. an ice cream sundae. The, the colors are saying restaurant to me. <laughs> yeah. And also too, just the setting of like, this is the last time I, I might see you for a bit. So we can fall out, slightly break the budget and mm. go to like a sit down restaurant. Yeah. I have visited one friend one time at boarding school and the only things around were super bougie because they would just catered to mostly people who had kids at the boarding school. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so I can see that. I can definitely see that. This scene is where I really felt the uh the the line about how they keep hurting each other. Yeah. Because the lines that Percy is saying when he said like why are you trying so hard to get rid of me? I was like, that's yeah. that's hard enough. And then saying, I would never do this to you. I was like, that is you trying to hurt her, actually. Uh, <laughs> but he's also a child, so that's that's valid. Yeah, but you can feel it. Like, again, we see from the Hermes thing that he carries guilt over this moment still. Mm-hmm. That's like, this is, even though it shows him in the car, I feel like this is the moment that Percy yeah. like, really is thinking of. Um, because this yeah. is both of them hurting each other because, you know, Sally walks away from this interaction crying, um, but also doesn't say anything to try and reassure him because she has no idea what she's doing. And so it's just, it's it's a painful scene for me. <laughs> I think this is, ooh, okay. I have some thoughts are coming in. Because I think this is an older Percy looking back on his younger self and regretting his actions here. And that's why, like, he feels so hurt. Like, I think there's a layer of it where he felt like he was being rejected and everything. That is part of the reason why this memory is so associated with pain for him. But I think also him looking back now, like, I think it was episode two, uh, references camp as, like, basically being just, like, another boarding school that he's been dropped off at, where he calls her the next day and is like, "I I hate it here, everything's miserable. And... Well, if they're following the books, um, he's got one memory of this for every year. And so I think the fact that he's thinking a lot about this drop-off moment and the fallout of it as he's going through this makes a lot of sense because it's been, like, what, a couple days? He's still in his first week at his new boarding school. Mm. I think it's, like, him starting to realize how much it hurt her, too. And I feel like him thinking about all of that makes so much sense to me as he's going to go save her because I feel like he's also having... He's thinking a lot more about all the things she's sacrificed for him, I think, in light of the Minotaur. Not that he hasn't realized this before, but I can see how that would be on his mind a lot. Which explains to me, at least, why this memory in this episode. Especially one that's marked with regret, because it's Dante's seventh circle of hell. (laughs) So, we get to Hades Palace. I love this palace design. I love how you can see in, like, the ceiling, like, the, the top of the underworld, that it looks almost like a lava flow like that's been solidified and it feels like we're like almost on the underside like pushed right up against the earth's crust which i think is so cool and he's got Mm -hmm. his little like inverted palace which um like leah mentioned is definitely feels very like we're in bizarro olympus yeah it's so empty yeah i was like how does this guy live like this (laughs) like god of riches in a big empty house yeah and that's like they go in it's this huge grand like moving very impressive palace of like this Again, it's like this slate when we know probably Olympus is going to be just like covered in marble. It's like a very opposite material. But then Hades sort of like, he's got his thrones, which we don't even like zoom in on or look at. We just see like a little. And then Hades just sort of ushers them over to a completely separate like carpeted lounge chairs, like very like, this is my den vibe. (laughs) Like this is where I smoke my cigars and drink my whiskey area that just like does not fit. 
And it's just such a small space. Yeah. That he's cut out for himself. Like, and he's so small in the frame when he walks in, too. Like, what a, what a choice for Hades, actually. I know. It's just like, it's like he's an outsider in his own home. Like, he's had to, like, mm-hmm. make his own, a space for himself. Like, and I can see how maybe this is taken from maybe an inspiration of this idea of, like, the underworld was a realm that existed before Hades, because we get in the mist that, like, Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon, like, cast lots to decide, like, who ruled over which realm. So this idea of this, like, place existing before him that he's kind of had to make do with, basically. Personality-wise, I was very intrigued by this Hades, because in the book, Percy says Hades is the first god that feels godlike to him. And he's, like, taller than any human, and he's wearing robes and a crown and all that. But here he, like, he walks in totally... He's chill. He's <laughs> <laughs> he's very chill. He doesn't seem like he doesn't like it here at all, really. Yeah, um, he offers him a snack. Offers him a snack. I was like, don't eat that. <laughs> I feel like Grover was about to take him up on it, too. He like, absolutely actually. was. I was like, Grover. <laughs> it almost elaborates on what the book already does well, which is the whole... Hades is always the villain and so you assume that Hades is the villain because like all of the stories that you consume Hades is the villain yeah and they've mentioned like all the stories where heroes go into the underworld to get somebody back and this Hades also doesn't feel like the Hades that like you know in Orpheus and Eurydice that would have made that Mm -hmm. deal with him it doesn't feel like that Hades that would have been so vindictive and so cunning well maybe not cunning but like so like trying like out like having it out for you basically yeah I feel like you, I mean, you don't have to, but but you have to (laughs) get him to a place where he's sort of intimidating so that you can do the whole Percy climbs out of the sticks and puts a sword to a god's throat and like, so that that moment feels like Percy has accomplished something incredible. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to build Hades into something more intimidating. So assuming that the Orpheus Mm -hmm. story is a true story in the way that the myth is told now, I'm curious where that part of him lives within him and how we'll see it if we'll see it because I mean there there is some of Orpheus in this moment with Percy trying to make a deal to bring his mom back and only being given bargain after bargain instead of him actually just letting her go but he isn't other than that a very physically intimidating presence so I'm curious what direction we're going to go with Hades in the show and whether that's an arc that we are going to take him on or if this is just who Hades is who we meet here yeah, I feel like we got such a small sample size. I really don't know. I don't feel strongly like we're not going to get there or strongly like we are going to get there. I feel like so in the middle. And I just think that's because y- you don't want to overexpose any of the gods this early. And mm-hmm. I think it was it was a mm-hmm. good scene. Um, but casting someone like Jay Duplass, like knowing his filmography credits, this was like a long term play. And I feel like we've I don't even want to say scratch the surface of like what Hades can be because I feel like we barely even did that. Like we just kind of saw one side of him uh, at a time where he feels very like oddly at peace because Mm -hmm. he knows there's a conflict brewing that he has really nothing to do with. And even though he's being blamed, he knows that like he didn't do anything wrong. And that kind of just puts him in a place of like, well, I'm safe down here. Um, And also too, when Poseidon and Zeus fight, I feel like if he's not involved, he just reaps the rewards. So he's just kind of like, like you guys said, like he's in just a place of like, all right, things are going on. I'm missing my helmet darkness. Like that's what I'm concerned about. Um, mm-hmm. And so also he has everyone else doing his bidding right now with like Electo and all that. So yeah, I, I don't think that we are in danger of Hades not becoming who he can be. Uh, and we are also not in danger of him becoming who he will be and all that. It's like very... Mm-hmm. mellow very very uh right down the middle right now yeah yeah i can kind of see it's sort of like with hermes in the last episode too where the change is so extreme and so sudden i think that sets up the idea that there's always the potential for this kind of shift in every in every one of the gods we've met i can i can see like how in the, i can see like the last olympian taking a lot of time with hades like him oh, and yeah, yeah. he has that awesome moment where like he rides in on the chariot right with like Nico yeah. by his side when I read uh, the books, especially in 2020, I imagined Hades as Tommy Shelby, uh, Killian Murphy's character from Peaky Blinders. Uh-huh. It's, it's, it's a very di- different interpretation than what I had in my head, but uh, it, it, still, it still feels like Hades. 
And it, it's interesting, too, because I think Hades has a lot of forms, both in Greek mythology, but I think also he's had a lot of interpretations outside of it, because I think the, it's this interesting thing where, again, like coming back to Dante a little bit, like the Christian iconography of the devil has kind of been conflated with him a lot. Mm-hmm. When in Greek myth, he's not really a devil at all. He's just sort of like a god ruling his domain. Like if we're doing this whole Dante setup, it makes that even more of a reversal. Like we're expecting this very evil man. And it sort of goes to reinforce that contrast when he shows up and he's just like, hey guys. Yeah, like his presence in the book, he comes across as the villain up until the moment that you realize that he isn't. But here, basically the second that you see him, you know that something's wrong. There are even things here like... um. At one point he says, family drama is why I don't go up there anymore. Like it's a choice on his part to not go up to Olympus anymore. Mm. And then he says like, these grudges, they go on forever, super unhealthy. And I was like, didn't Bianca say that grudges are what Hades kid's fatal flaw is? (laughs) Hmm. I was like, I'm going to have to reintroduce myself to this guy. (laughs) (laughs) You know what's funny is I was thinking about Hades also because I was thinking about all the family dynamic stuff and I was like, he's giving very strong little brother energy. But Mm -hmm. then I was thinking about it more and what you just said made me actually be like, maybe this is actually oldest brother. Uh, Maybe this is actually oldest brother. He's like, I'm done with this drama. Let my old younger (laughs) siblings fight it out. Like, I don't, I'm the peacekeeper here. Um, Which Uh. would track because Zeus is the baby brother in mythology. Mm -hmm. I I can't remember if Hades or Poseidon. I think Hades might be the list. I'm not sure, though. On the topic of Christianity finding its way into Mm -hmm. these stories, I do want to talk about this uh, painting that Hades has chosen to hang in his home, the only decoration he's chosen to hang in his home. He has a a triptych behind him by um, Hieronymus Bosch. Mm. Essentially, what you're looking at in this one, you see it so briefly, it's just one shot during the, like, helm reveal. In the first panel... It is the Garden of Eden. In the Ah. second panel, up for debate, there are different interpretations of it, but potentially being um, humanity with free will in the second panel. So like making all kinds of chaos, having a lot of fun with it. Um, Or it's what would happen if Adam and Eve had like stayed in the garden. So it's like still the garden if they hadn't taken the fruit and been expelled. And so it's a world in which they never gained that knowledge of good and evil. Huh. Like, if they hadn't made their choice, what the world would be. A little bit golden agey, in my opinion, that interpretation. And then the last panel is hell. So a lot of interpretations of these three together are that it's about the consequences of giving humanity free will. And mm. the framing of this shot, you have Sally in the Garden of Eden reaching out for them, Hades in the middle, and then Grover and Percy in hell. So Sally is frozen in this part of the painting that is before consequences, before good and evil, before knowledge, before that could be a part of any human decision. Hades is in the middle ground, and then Grover and Percy mm-hmm. are standing in hell in consequences, so trying to make their choice. Yeah. <laughs> I think about this too, because like we go into this episode with the framing that like saving Sally, whether or not they save Sally, is sort of the big decision that Percy has to make. And we've mm-hmm. had this set up from the beginning. Like, this is the sort of big thing that's going to happen. You know, like, he's not going on this quest to get the bolt. He's going to get his mom. And so, like, this idea of, like, is he going to bargain with the bolt? Also, is he going to, when Hades introduces this offer of sanctuary, too, like, is he going to take the offer? Is he going to choose safety, choose to enter the garden, if you will, choose to, like, stay in a place where he's just sort of going to sit everything out and not have agency or be in hell, but, like, that's sort of the price. Mm -hmm. And I like Sally as being this, like, question mark of, like, are you going to stay with her there, or are you going to take her out, eat the Mm -hmm. apple, I guess? Right, leave sanctuary, or stay here and remain safe, eat the apple Mm -hmm. or not. Yep. Percy, though, when it all comes out about the bolt and the helm and everything, and he realizes there's this great wider war, he ends up choosing not to take sanctuary, not to take his mom, but to go figure everything out and hopefully get her back later. And he says, mm-hmm. hold fast. Yeah. And we get the final piece of this Sally flashback. Yes. I do want to note, though, the line, I'm not messing around here, kid. This only ends one way. The only question is how difficult you make it from Hades. 
direct parallel to that first uh, flashback. Oh, I didn't even notice with that. With Sally. And so this is kind of where everything was starting to come together for me of like why these flashbacks were here because it was the idea of like hurting someone you love, putting them in a situation that's dangerous for them or, or that they will suffer for, but just hoping that you come out of it better on the other side and then leaving them behind. That Percy is making that same choice for Sally that Sally has been making for him for all of those years. Yeah, that makes total sense. I'd like because I feel like a lot of this episode is about choice and knowing that your choice will hurt for now but mm-hmm. having hope that you will be better for it. Which we get really epitomized in the next scene, too. Yes. When the man himself <laughs> <laughs> walks in. Liam, you have to report back when you watch Black Sails uh, about this man. <laughs> He's so good. Yeah, Walker, I, I had never heard his voice before. And Walker told me, I think at the premiere, he was just like raving about how cool his accent is. <laughs> and I, in my head, I was like, okay, it's probably like British or Australian because those are just in my head. I'm like, those are cool accents. And I, I don't even know what his accent is, but it's just so regal. It's just like when, <laughs> when he speaks, I'm like, I feel like I'm like in like, I'm, I'm at like a very expensive museum and he's the tour guide. <laughs> he, he's yeah. yeah, he was, he was great. And I remember too, Poseidon being conflicted when he was cast because like, I know everyone hates the, like I, I'm especially as a Marvel guy, I'm so sick of fan casting because like Fantastic Four has like ruined it for everyone in terms of just like everyone waiting and having so many different ideas and then different people come along, whatever. Percy Jackson was one that like everyone obviously had in their mind, like who they want to play certain characters. And for me, Poseidon, I was always like, oh, like a Chris Hemsworth or like something like that, like, <laughs> like an A-list movie star that I feel like could just like play like the like regalness but also like comedic bits at times and so for me toby stevens was like such an unknown that i had nothing to go off of and i wasn't like against the casting i was like oh i think he like looks the part but can he embody the part and this like we're not talking about the finale obviously but like this one scene i was like oh my god that (laughs) that dude is poseidon just like the way like the energy shifted when he walked in the room before Mm -hmm. before you even saw his face before the camera even focused on him because for a long time you could tell he was sitting there but it's so focused on sally and just yeah it's like that dude is important but he also treats sally like an equal he doesn't like use his like godly status to be like i'm controlling this conversation and i thought there was just a perfect balance of like this guy is clearly important but also he's not throwing his weight around and that Mm. to me is Poseidon and Mm -hmm. uh, just like the dialogue too of they don't look at each other it embodies the whole like you got to stay away because being present only hurts both it's like yeah there's a lot there's a lot to break down with this one Uh uh-huh I especially the thing about his uh their conversation it's very rare in this conversation that he speaks more than three words at a time and most of them are just to prompt her to continue her thought yeah. And it's like we get so little of him, but it's just like his his presence. His mm. it's so heavy when he walks in and sits down. You're like, ooh. That's actually why I I kept wondering: is he actually there, or is she just talking to him? And are they visually depicting it? Like, is she praying to him right now? Yeah, they never look at each other. Like it, like you saying it's like he doesn't. He, he's just like prompting her to say more. I kept thinking like that is sort of like prayers, isn't it? Where you sort of hear that voice in your head. I imagine I'm not devout enough to have prayed in earnest, but I imagine like I've seen people when they talk about it's like they sort of feel this like guidance basically. But Hmm. I do I want I want to think I want to believe that this is him genuinely talking to her because I think this also it establishes a very human tether to his reasoning for why he's been staying away so long when before what we've really gotten is like Hermes parroting that in a way that doesn't make me feel very confident because Hermes also does not feel very confident that that was the right call. I um, think he's definitely there. <laughs> he's definitely there in real life to me. I like to think that the uh, Posali shippers won with this one. <laughs> <laughs> and because the implications of it where she like, she doesn't even have to look at him to know that he's there. Like this is commonplace enough that he just shows up. I was like, if someone needs to call up our friend Ashley immediately. <laughs> I was I was thinking about that too, because Krusty says to Percy like, oh, you've got dad's eye. <laughs> it's 
he absolutely has dad's eyes is the thing like they, they look very similar <laughs> I like both interpretations. I do believe that he is there. And part of that too is like her not looking at Poseidon to me is like just further acknowledging this is so so painful to have you around at all. And like, sure, him showing up is like, I love that too for the character of Poseidon because this is him. In previous to this, it's like, oh, he's only going to show up in quite literally a fight or flight scenario where percy's gonna die if he doesn't save him and he saves him but here we get a little bit more of his humanity of like sally's just going through it she's just having a rough day mm-hmm. and he still shows up i'm like that to me is what makes poseidon different from zeus yeah. um but beyond that too them not looking at each other directly is i think it's just an acknowledgement of like there's just too much pain there of like mm-hmm. there's something about like you can have a conversation with someone on the phone but like as soon as like you're like face to face the energy shifts like it just there's there's something different about it and so that's how i interpreted it of like they recognize that they need to be there for each other or poseidon more so needs to be there for sally uh when he can be but they operate with the level of rules because they know going too far in will just lead to problems and all that um Mm -hmm. but I, i do like the idea too of like i i i'm a pretty faithful guy i'm a christian and like in prayer before like that is how it feels at times like when 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 you're you don't know where you're starting but like you want to get to a certain place and there is that kind of like voice in your head of that's like encouraging but not in like a dialogue sense not like a back and forth of like just like a keep going expand that kind of stuff so i like that interpretation and i i appreciate that that's like could be something that people could take away from it you know Mm. I do like that, kind of going off of what you said about his humanity, we've been building this image of Poseidon over the course of the season, and, you know, we could have met him like we do in the books in the throne room with all of the drama and gravitas that comes with that, but instead we meet him on Earth at the bar, and even though we don't hear that much from him, like, he's kind and he listens. Yeah. It's just a a much more down-to-earth kind of, I mean, literally, way to introduce us to Poseidon. Because at first, when I when I started the scene, I thought we weren't going to see him because of the way that it was framed. I thought the the camera was never going to like go wide enough that we would actually see his face. But I think introducing him here, like actually having us see him here in this situation first, really lets you feel that side of him. I was also thinking a lot the first time I watched it when Sally first summons him with the match and the ice cream. Mm -hmm. I first was like, ooh, love that. <laughs> love that they had set this world building up and then they're executing. I was like, it works. It actually works. <laughs> it, yeah, that was my first reaction. Second time around, though, I was sitting there and I was remembering the rules that Luke gave Percy where he was basically saying, the more you miss something, the more the god will take you. The god like knows you're serious. And I kept thinking about the fact that Sally just drops a match into Percy's leftover ice cream that's already about to be bust. Like, this is not something she cares deeply about. I wonder what this says about their relationship, because to me it either says that he has been really paying really close attention and he's going to show up when she calls him. And it also leads me to believe that she probably doesn't call him all that often, just because, like, from what we've seen of his char- her, her characterization, that makes sense to me. But I also thought how interesting that was like, if Luke is speaking from his own experience here, but not actually giving the real world building, which is essentially that a god will show up for you if they want to. <laughs> so choosing to believe that you maybe whatever you didn't sac whatever you sacrificed wasn't important enough is a way to maybe feel like, oh, okay, they're still out there for me. So mm. I don't know. I was just thinking a lot about that. And I want to echo also one of the lines I wrote down from the scene that I think really does underline your points as well is, beside an outright says, like, you have no you have no one to say it to talking mm. about like the mythological world and all the problems she's going through and that's maybe the most unfair part of it mm-hmm. i do i really like this setup of him as a character it's making me like him which is unfortunate we were very anti-gods over here <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad they cast toby stevens actually <laughs> And then we get this, oh, there was a line that I didn't mention that I'm in- intrigued by. When Sally says, I want him to know who he is before your family tries to tell him who they want him to be. He is better than that. We ha- He has better things in him than yeah. that. Um, which obviously echoes a lot of what we've learned about what 
Sally was trying to do here and about this family in general. But I was curious about Sally's experience with his family and where that feeling comes from. If that's just hmm. coming from how she assumes that the gods are based on the myths, or if it's coming from a personal experience with them, or if it's coming from stories that Poseidon has told her about them or warned her about. There is probably some anti-Zeus pillow talk. Like, I, you gotta <laughs> imagine, right? Like, ru- oh, rough yeah. day on Olympus. Like, <laughs> I don't see, like, everything we've seen or heard of between Zeus and Poseidon, it's like, one of their relationship is positive. You know, that it's contentious, mm-hmm. like, 24-7. Especially yeah. with the, you know, the pact and all that. Like, that being the freshest thing. Like, obviously, gods have been around for, like, millennia. But, like, the pact has been around for, what, 70, 80 years? That feels yeah. like some time has probably passed. Um yeah, I would think that there's some firsthand recollections from Poseidon himself about his dysfunctional family. I'm sure (laughs) there was, you know, a heavy lightning storm in Montauk one day or something where, you know, maybe not even for nefarious means, but just like for Zeus to reaffirm his control and power. Because like Zeus is the most egotistical of all the gods. And it's like, it's very clear that Poseidon is someone that even if Poseidon's not surging for the throne he wants to always remind him who has it per se so Mm. yeah i I could i could see some some actual stories from poseidon himself Mm. yeah i can see that i can see that come in later they love flashbacks they love a flashback i'm excited for i'm excited (laughs) for the like what more they do with these because it's great regardless of what flashbacks they pull from the books specifically i hope we still get original flashbacks because i think they're Mm -hmm. They add to the story so much. And I remember yeah. at first being like, oh, we're getting like a young Percy and it's a different actor. Like, how am I going to feel about this? Like, is it going to feel like two separate characters? And you know, Azrael is a phenomenal casting. So he's been fantastic. But even the flashbacks that don't fully involve him, like this one with uh, Poseidon and Sally, I think they just, they add so much more color to the story uh, mm-hmm. than can ever be, you know, thought of when it's only from a first person perspective in the books. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I mean, even just in the books, I love the flashbacks that we do get, like when Hestia, like, has Percy see that flashback. Um, It's it's the greatest scene in literature. (laughs) (laughs) I I, like, I love, like, that conversation with Hermes, I wrote an article the other day, just breaking down why, to me, Hermes is, like, the most important god in the entire book series, and Mm. so I had to, like, pull quotes from that scene, and the last Olympian to me, I got Avengers Endgame behind me as well, that they're in the same vein of like, I don't want to watch that movie or read that book too much because I want to preserve its like specialty. And I've mm-hmm. only read The Last Olympian cover to cover like twice. And so rereading the scene to pull quotes from it for an article, I was like, I was tearing up and I was like, this is not normal. I feel like I should, I know the scene like the back of my hand, but I've only read it firsthand now for three times and yeah if and when fingers crossed we get that in a season five i just like it's gonna be the greatest thing ever it's gonna win so many emmys charlie is gonna just uh just it's we were talking about this in our like uh, book five episode like how some of those scenes with luke and the the last olympian are just gonna be so Mm -hmm. they're just like acting candy in terms of like the depths you can go to and i'm just so excited because they've they've been knocking out of the park with their casting so cannot wait okay then we get this this closing moment this incredible closing moment yeah it's in montauk but with the tide all the way out (laughs) and poseidon says uh well first of all sally says do you want to talk to him i know you shouldn't but maybe just to hear his voice and poseidon says one day one day when he's ready when he knows who he is and where he belongs, and fate has revealed to him his true path. On that day, I'll be right by his side. Fate has revealed to him his true path. Mm. Just an interesting uh, part mm. of that quote that I would like to flag. <laughs> yeah, and then he picks up his, he picks himself up, turns around, and we get that great shot of Ares on the beach. Ares fight! Ares fight! <laughs> <laughs> I'm so hyped. So the way that we wrap up each of these episodes is um, that we design what a bead would look like if we were to design a bead based on the episode um, for our our end of summer necklace. Um, So what would you guys put on your 
end of summer bead for episode seven? That's a really good question because there's so much like to pick from. Six was probably the easiest. It was just like something from the Lotus, right? Because it's like one. Yeah, what did location, we pick for six? What did we pick for six? I think I picked uh, Hermes's watch. Oh yeah, mm. and I chose uh, the keys. His keys. Oh, there's. Can I go on a side tangent real quick? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's a great theory I just saw on Twitter today about Hermes was stalling them, not so much that they fail the quest, but to hopefully prevent Luke from becoming who he saw him, what what he would be uh, from that flashback we just talked about. But by him trying to prevent it, he only like cemented it further. And like maybe mm -hmm. there's a world, like I know everyone's like up in arms about having the the solstice deadline pass rather than them just meet it at the midnight hour and maybe if they met it at the solstice in this interpretation luke wouldn't have turned yet but mm. because hermes tried to meddle like that's that's the thing with like prophecy and fate in in percy jackson lore and just greek, greek mythology as a whole is like the more you try to like block it or interfere the like not necessarily quicker it happens, but just like the more it happens, the more it like solidifies. And so I just found that theory very interesting. And I also like, I love this, how this fandom just like anytime something gets changed, changed from the books, the way people cope is they just make a theory about it <laughs> and they <laughs> find a way. It. Yeah. They find a way to like, okay, here's how it makes even more sense. And it, yeah. it works for me so far. Like every like little yeah. change, I'm like, Oh, I, I see where you're coming from. Yeah. That's kind of what we usually try to do where we're like, they changed it. Okay. Let's assume this was a good decision <laughs> and we'd go from there. <laughs> but that's a, that's an interesting point. Cause we talked about that considering the, possibility that hermes knows luke's fate but not looking at it as him trying to help at all we were like he sees it and he's given up basically like he tried to help and then gave up and so this was him just trying to make sure that nothing happened to interfere with fate but in not interfering he was interfering <laughs> and so cemented luke's fate th further mm -hmm. but it's an interesting idea that he was actually trying to help there it's a good theory <laughs> so beats yeah I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with the 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 ice cream, the empty oh, ice cream container that's a with good the smoke one. coming out of it. That's a really good one. I think that's mine. I was trying to think of something like that because that is my favorite scene from the episode and one of my favorite scenes from the whole season. I was saying to a friend, I was like, "This is HBO. Like, this is not mm. Disney Plus right now. This is just like the the quality, <laughs> like the dialogue. The not to say Disney Plus doesn't produce quality TV from time to time. It does, but just like <laughs> I should I, I should be paying premium for this." Yeah, that's a good one. My ideas, like, compared to that one are kind of basic, because my ideas right now are, like, the pit, an artistic rendition of the pit. Because mm. we didn't mention, that thing is scary. It is so big. <laughs> yeah. I'm really trying to think of, of a, a unique one, but, I, like, I think the, the ice cream dish is pretty good. I mean, I guess you could include the match in it, too, because that's, like, kind of crucial mm. to the summoning mm. side. But also, it's like, well, these are camp necklaces for us i presume as viewers because for percy it's like well he he has no memory of that scene because he didn't see it mm -hmm. so yeah. i'm like from what happened to percy if someone tried to make that painting on a bead with like a very yeah. like zoomed in lens <laughs> or something that that'd be impressive um <laughs> for for a collaborative effort here the ice cream one but then the bead itself is like the pattern that hades is wearing on his robe it's like a mm. cool little like mm. I, I I really appreciated that they didn't just go black and white with Hades and it was like there was like some green in there. I think there mm. might have been like dark purple or navy blue, but they they did very like dreary but like subtly lively colors. And so mm -hmm. I I really appreciated that. And also I think they gave him a little eyeshadow, right? Oh, did they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I think so. <laughs> he he looked different from the still image they shared uh on socials beforehand. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I, I, I like a little, little, you know, He's got gloomy the eye shadow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to Monster Donut. William, thanks so much for joining us. First of all, you all need to go check out 
all of his incredible interviews with the cast. Um, he and these kids have a fantastic bond and it's just so fun to watch. A quick story I want to share also, just because I think it was really funny, was when we were all at the premiere, uh, Liam and us and Mike and a bunch of other people, uh, the Seaweed Brain folks, of course, were all sort of some of the last to leave. And uh, I remember Walker getting into like an SUV to leave. And I don't even think you heard this, but he literally shouted out the window, bye Liam, (laughs) (laughs) like as his last thing from the premiere. which was adorable. Erica from Seaweed Brain told me that that happened recently. And I was like, I have no memory of it. So I'm now that I have two accounts of it, I'm like, this clearly wasn't a hallucination. Like it no! actually happened. So yeah, he's he's great. Um, and very mature for his age. It's wild, like just how he like carries himself. And um, I had Pierre Gill, who's the director of photography on my show recently. And just the way the technical people talk about Walker is like, awesome so he's a he's a great guy and it's uh, yeah. uh that's cool to hear speaking of your show please go ahead and, and tell people where they can find you what kind of projects you do yeah so my show is uh riptide radio it lives on uh comic book nation's youtube channel as well as comic book nation's podcast platforms uh comic book nation is essentially uh our brand show uh under the comic book banner and yeah, it operates more like an after show as opposed to a podcast. Uh, we fortunately have had the luxury of being able to pre-record everything because of screeners. So thank you, Mickey Mouse, for sending those our way. Um, <laughs> and yeah, every uh, Tuesday at like 945 Eastern, roughly like 15, 20 minutes after the episode wraps, uh, it premieres on YouTube. And myself and my co-host, Nicole Drum, uh, also from Comic Book, uh, we have essentially a, it, it's so funny i love appearing on podcasts like this because this is where we like to really get to like dissect stuff um we're you know 20 minutes here and there uh kind of recapping events that happen what we like uh what we loved stuff from the book comparing and contrasting and then every week we have uh, a guest on the show so we've had uh adam copeland who played aries on our episode five review uh we had Aryan samhadri grover of course uh on our episode four review uh, we recently like i said had pierre gill And if all goes well, uh, we'll have some big guests for uh, seven and eight when those episodes come out. So if you're listening to this, uh, episode seven is already out there. So if you want to catch it on replay, uh, would appreciate y'all checking that out. And then uh, outside of Riptide Radio, I'm on all socials uh, at Liam T. Crowley, uh, most prominently on Instagram these days. And that's where a lot of my interview clips live. And fortunately... um, I have some fun ones coming out, so uh, I will leave it at that. But again, I appreciate you guys having me on. And this is like, I love how you guys structure this podcast. It's so like (laughs) relaxed and like, so not what I'm used to in the best way possible. (laughs) This, this, this Gen Z energy can be like exhausting at times to talk at like 2.5 speed 24 (laughs) seven. And so like, I love just getting to like, feel like I'm like in a Ted talk and be like here's what this meant and I, I felt like i learned something on this so so thank you guys this was awesome yeah glad to hear you enjoyed it <laughs> thank you <laughs> oh man meanwhile we're both in here like oh no we're talking too much oh no i i love just like sitting back and like listening because it's like i i hear myself talk 24 7 it is for better or worse my job to do so so it's nice to like hear other people and and hear your perspectives and now, when I rewatch this episode, it's like I have so much more things to look out for, you know? Awesome. Well, thank you. That's great to hear. And thank you again for joining us. Next time, we're talking episode eight, The Prophecy Comes True. I'm not saying you should rewatch Phoebe's video essay before episode eight, but I'm not not saying. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to rewatch my video essay and figure out what that means. <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, we want to thank all of our patrons. RK, Window Wells, Emily Ann Bonnie, Roman Consul, Latino Kaya, Patty VCK, Bethany from Public Works, Sydney Fox, Joke, Reina Avila Ramirez Ariano, Charlie McNeil, Bronte Lebo, Chief and Plays, Robert Gamer, Kels, Kari, Leila Hussein, Mason Bowman, Casey Cassidy, and Evelyn Zamudio. So if you would like to become a patron, you can find that link in all of our social media, um, in our link tree, at PJOPod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, You can also join the conversation over there. We're obviously very close to the end, so if you'd like to contribute a question or your own analysis or an argument, 
to our <laughs> Uh, wrap up at the end of the season where we'll talk about the whole season you can do that either by dming us or responding to one of our posts on those social media sites or by sending an email to monster donut podcast at gmail.com or by commenting on uh our episodes on spotify what else merch shop exists <laughs> go to yes. monsterdonut.redbubble.com to get your Cleos and Nostos shirts and also whatever else is up there there's a lot of team Cleos, not a lot of team Nostos so we definitely need no, some team Nostos we are for- not selling, like team Nostos needs to step up we're getting so many <laughs> more Cleos than Nostos purchases <laughs> and like the votes in that one poll for episode 2 yeah, uh, but thank you all so much for supporting us um, thank you all for commenting. Thank you all for reading and reviewing if you have done so. It really means a lot to us. And we love hearing from y'all. I'm so excited to talk wrap up too because there's just so much to unpack. I can't believe it's almost over. Yeah, I need season two. I'm gonna, as soon as the show ends, I'm gonna go watch The Old Man and Black Sails and like hope that it fills the void. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, watch Black Sails. It's great. I cannot say that. I watched all of it. Yes, Emily finished Black Sails. Everybody, congratulate her. <laughs> <laughs> Until the next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.